good evening to all of you uh, it's my pleasure to welcome professor sandeep varma from india and uh, also all the audience to the 10th inspire webinar today so uh, it's a proud moment to the department of chemistry and to me as the head of the department of department of chemistry because uh, we have reached to the 10th uh, event of the inspire webinar series and uh, you know that we've just reached to this uh, 10th uh, webinar today just within a very short period within uh, four months from uh, last uh, june and uh, through this uh, inspire webinar uh, series uh, we were able to just uh, provide our students and the, the staff a chance to just reveal the scientist uh, in them and also we were able to keep them intact with the global research by inviting that uh, well known scientist all over the world so in doing so we just uh, just uh, invited many scientists uh, throughout the world and also uh, some scientists just uh, generated from our department also so uh, on this special day i think uh, uh, you all will be very happy to just uh, see what we've done uh, during our past nine uh, inspire webinars uh, therefore just uh, even before we just introduce our invited speaker professor varma uh, so uh, if we just uh, briefly just look back and then see what we've done during the past few months uh, so then uh, let's spend few minutes to just uh, see the flashback of what uh, uh, we went through so that i will just invite uh, nipun or gautami to just show us Okay, so that's how we've just uh, provided our student a chance to just spend their time during the uh, last uh, period, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. So without taking much time, I would like to invite uh, Professor Anuravi Kramasingha to introduce uh, Professor Varma to the audience. Thank you, Professor Manav Devi. Uh, invited speaker today, Professor Andeep Parma, Professor Manav Devi Ganehinige, uh, head of the Department of Chemistry and members of the academic staff present and past of the faculty of science of the university of peradeniya and dear students it's a pleasure for me to introduce professor sandeep verma whom i met 31 years back in 1990 as a young graduate student at the college of pharmacy of university of illinois at chicago and i was also a postdoctoral fellow in the same lab we were working together in the department of uh, medicinal chemistry and pharmacognosy. Professor Verma has a very long resume and has many achievements. I will try to keep it short. Uh, he graduated 
his uh, with his uh, first degree, bachelor's degree and master's degree from uh, Bara, Banaras Hindu University in India, specializing in organic chemistry. He obtained his PhD in synthetic medicinal chemistry in 1994 after I left the uh, UIC. Uh, and he obtained uh, postdoctoral experience, one at the Bloomberg School of Public Health, Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, and another at the prestigious Max Planck Institute for Experimental Medicine in Göttingen, Germany, before returning to India to accept the academic position at the IIT Kanpur, Indian Institute of Technology. Uh, He's also the recipient of several prestigious fellowships, including the Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship to work at the Kekule Institute for Organic Chemistry and Biochemistry at the University of Bonn in Germany. His research interests include bio-inspired nanomaterials, chemical neuroscience, and new antibiotics. With over 200 publications to date, his work has been recognized by many awards, prizes, and medals. The Shanti Swara uh, Bhatnagar Prize, Distinguished Aluminous Award of Banaras Hindu University, A.V. Rama Rao Technology Award, J.C. Bose Fellowship, Goyal Prize, Chemical Research Society uh, of India Silo Medal, Department of Atomic Energy Scientific Research Council Outstanding Investigator Award, Swarna Jayanti Fellowship, and BM Birla Science Prize, to name a few. He's an elected fellow of the Indian National Science Academy, Indian Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Sciences India, and Royal Society of Chemistry, United Kingdom. He's an associate editor of Chemical Communications and uh, serves as the on the editorial advisory boards of Chem, uh, Chem Biochem and General of Peptide uh, Science. Currently, Professor Sandeep Parma serves as the Secretary to the Science and Engineering Research Board, Department of Science and Technology of Government of India. Over to you, Sandeep. Thank you very much. Uh, are you able to hear me? So, uh, yes, OK, we can hear you. Great, thank you. So first of all, let me thank uh, Professor Gane Henneke, uh, the chairperson of the Department of Chemistry, uh, Professor Anura Vikramasinghe, who has been a very friendly mentor, and my uh, he, he, he was in the lab when I was trying to learn how to do research. So I owe him a great debt of gratitude. Uh, he made me what I am today by showing me how to do research, how to do good research and very many things that I learned from him and his family, I will always remain grateful. And of course, for this invitation that I am here today discussing a bit, a little bit of about of our work that we do in the Department of Chemistry and Center of Nanoscience at IIT Kanpur. So uh, I'm very delighted to be here for this inspired lecture. And I would wish to extend my felicitations for all faculty members attending this uh, webinar and all the students who have uh, taken the time out today to listen to what I'm going to tell you about our work uh, this evening. So with these words, please allow me to share my screen so that we can start the lecture. Are you able to see my uh, slide, Professor Vikramasinghe? Yes, we can see. Okay, go ahead. All right, great. So, so as the title suggests, I think you may have seen the abstracts as well as the title that I'm going to talk to you about uh, how we, uh, what we do in terms of research with a peptide-based palette, peptide-based systems, and how have we have we have been using these peptide-based palette for chemical neuroscience. Uh, one example from stem cell engineering and from applied coloration. So basically there are very many areas that we touch upon. I'll come to that a bit later, but more important to tell you is that our research not only deals with synthetic molecules, but it also applies them to uh, translational areas of interest where there is a possibility to get nice patterns, where there is possibility to get publications as well as you know how we can bring up the science to the level of excitement that we look forward to. So, uh, 
So, so if you if you look at the the entire research scope of our laboratory at IIT Kanpur, we work on soft materials, peptide-based systems. We also work work on artificial and engineered surfaces. And one of our very recent area of interest is green batteries, where we are using DNA as a precursor to 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 synthesize batteries that are very exciting in terms of their output very exciting in terms of their compatibility with very many systems. And of course they are green in nature because they, we seldom get the kind of toxicity you anticipate or you expect for, for battery materials. So today I'm not gonna talk to you about battery materials, but I'm going to limit myself to neuroscience, stem cells and applied coloration. Before we go ahead, I would like to thank uh, the people who actually do the work, they execute and they bring the nicest results to the table. On, on the left side of the panel, if you will, you would find a So here are the, the PhD students here, are here. We have several postdoctoral fellows. The collaborations in the kind of interdisciplinary research we do always is of great help when we have collaborators, not only from within the Institute, but across India, as well as, you know, all the way to Tel Aviv, where my good friend Ehud Gazit helps us with quite a bit of peptide-based systems. And funding sources are from Department of Biotechnology, Science and Engineering Research Board, and Department of Science and Technology Nanomission. So with this, with this set of very talented individuals and collaborators, we, are, we have set aside or we have created a niche in chemical biology and biology-based research in India. Happy to share some of the details with you today. So let me uh, start with what is uh, neuroscience. And we are going to tell you in, in fact about a very simple molecule, which is nitric oxide. And most of you know that nitric oxide is not only a small, Small uh, molecule which is gaseous in nature in the body inside the brain cells. It serves as a neuromodulator it, and it also serves as a neuroprotective agent. Now, depending on the concentration of nitric oxide which are going to be achieved in neuronal cells, you could get the right kind of signaling and regulation, which is also related to the dendritic growth in the, in the neuronal cells. But if it is going to be uh, uh, synthesized in larger quantities or unregulated quantities, it can also lead to kind of uh, toxicity, which is best avoidable when you look at the neuronal cells. So how is it synthesized? A question naturally arises, it, that arises is that how these gaseous molecules are synthesized in our brain. So basically what happens is that you use L-arginine, in this, this particular essential amino acid, and through a, a enzymatic conversion, you synthesize nitric oxide and L-arginine gets converted to citrulline. And nitric oxide being gaseous in nature, it can permeate, it can diffuse to the cells and it has quite a number of biochemical manifestations if you look at its uh, application within the cell. What it can do essentially is that it can create quite a bit of oxidative stress by tyrosine nitration. It can do a, a number of S nitrosylation on the thiol groups within the amino acids within the proteins. So one of these, these reactions leads to neurotoxicity and the other reaction, if it is going to be done in the right way, offers neuroprotection. Now, once you have synthesized nitric oxide, it can diffuse, as I just mentioned, it can also diffuse into target cells and it can, it can upregulate what is called as soluble guanylate cyclase. So, so soluble guanylate cyclase can get activated by nitric oxide, which can convert GTP to cyclic GMP. And many of you would know that cyclic GMP is a second messenger, which is responsible for very many pharmacolog pharmacological activities. And all these activities are listed here. I'm not going to read them, but what essentially I want to convey is that this small molecule nitric oxide has enormous biochemical manifest manifestations in our body. It has important functions and it, these functions are regulated by the concentration in which you would synthesize nitric oxide in a given type of uh, a cell. But but one can imagine that when we are trying to eat drugs, right? When we eat drugs, they are in the part of a tablet or a capsule or even injection. But when you have a gas in hand, and if you want to 
deliver gas inside a cell what are the delivery methods available for us for such type of delivery proposition and that forms the basis of our uh, uh, our discussion at the moment so basically we were enamored by a report long back in the journal of cell cycle where this aspirin based molecule if you can see this aspirin based molecule uh, if you can see this aspirin based molecule was prepared and this nitro this this nitrate ester was responsible for the release of nitric oxide inside the cells and it regulated quite a number of biological manifestation which relate which was related to human ovarian cancer it the how to suppress the xenograft rejection and so on and so forth so what we realize is that it, this is a nice vehicle this is a nice platform to generate nitric oxide and we took this idea and we we, we move forward with the the hope that can we come up or could we come up with a strategy that we could also synthesize nitric oxide not only synthesis of nitric oxide but synthesis of nitric oxide in a very regulated fashion which is shown by these molecules so these molecules did release nitric oxide but it was not really or it was not truly in the fashion of sustained release so for sustained release the chemical description the chemical man manipulation is to be such that the release of nitric oxide occurs over a period of time and at a concentration that is achievable and well tolerated by uh, by by tissues by cells right so we have taken this particular molecular design which is based on salicylic acid so if you were to look at this particular structure i'm going I'm, i would like to walk you through this structure that what goes behind in our thought process that why would you synthesize such a molecule right so you start with salicylic acid fair enough and it's a very standard molecule for all of us for all organic chemists to to you know so they we all know about salicylic acid so you take salicylic acid you take the phenolic group and you equip with a molecule that is eventually going to serve as nitric oxide release trigger you take the carboxylic acid of salicylic acid and you connect or we connect it to a dipeptide which is tryptophan tryptophan dipeptide the way it is shown here because we have good experience in our lab that if you have a ditryptophan molecule it sort of inter interdigitates over one another and it it offers you the possibility of a spherical molecule or a spherical ensemble where a lot of these these nitrate esters are embedded and eventually when these nitrate esters are are challenged by thiol groups within our body they start releasing nitri nitrite ion first followed by nitric oxide through a series of chemical reactions which can be model modulated which can be followed and which where we can ensure the amount of nitric oxide being released is at the level of your choice so that is a very intricate very very simple yet complex design and we were able to uh, achieve the release of nitric oxide with the help of cellular thiols which take up this this particular uh, uh, they break up this particular ester to s nitrosothiol and eventually s nitrosothiols get converted to nitric oxide so you have a handle through which you can release a gaseous molecule inside the cell at a at a at a sustained pace at a concentration of your choice and this paper was published about 3 years back in chemical science and since then we have made made tremendous advances in this particular design strategy so first question is that before you even start putting these compound inside cell culture you would like to know that that is it going to release uh, uh, nitrite ions it is is it going to release release nitric oxide gas so for this there is a very simple reaction that we have done we have taken the, the conjugate and we have challenged or reacted with, with with glutathione so glutathione is present in our body and our argument was that if our conjugate can interact with glutathione and if they can release nitrite ions which can be checked or which can be quantified with the help of grease assay then our design strategy has merit we will, we are sure that it is going to release nitrite ions and through internal metabolic processes or metabolic steps nitrite ions are going to be converted to nitric oxide gas and indeed the chemical reaction that would happen for for the generation of nitric uh, nitrite anion is shown right here of course it's a it's a it's a very simple reaction pathway where you see how how nitrate 
is being transferred to this as uh, to this, this particular thiol group which is highlighted here and eventually when you have this this nitrosylated thiols they would eventually release nitrite ions that are we are, that we are going to detect with the help of grease assay so here uh, here are two charts which basically shows you that what are the uh, the release percentages of nitrite ions and what we eventually balanced out in terms of one millimolar glutathione. So we took a, 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 our molecule, we challenged it with a function of glutathione concentration means 0.5 millimolar glutathione all the way to five millimolar molar glutathione. And here is the release of nitrites. And, and you can see a very nice sigmoidal curve. A nice sigmoidal curve of release profile means that you have cooperativity in the system. So the release kinetics is falling, following a cooperative behavior. And finally we honed down, finally we narrowed to the concentration of one millimolar, which we thought was a very pretty looking sigmoidal curve. And that sort of gave us an idea or gave us a handle that this particular concentration is going to work quite well with our system. And we were ready to take our system inside the neuronal cells or inside the neurons. So what we did is that we checked neuro 2A cell line. So it's a neuroblastoma cell line. So here is a, a neuronal cell line that you would grow. And during the growth culture, you would create quite a number of positive and negative controls. And also a, a petri dish where you would have your compound, which is part of the system. And it is going to go inside the neuronal cell, release nitrite anions, and eventually give the possibility of generation of nitrate, nitrite, uh, nit oxide gas. So what you see here is uh, uh, it's a very, very interesting, interesting concept that if you were to not have compound in the, in the dish and you try to do uh, an assay, a fluorescence assay to see whether your nitric oxide gas is being released in neurons or not. So at zero concentration of your conjugate, the conjugate which has the tryptopdipeptide, which also has the nitrite releasing trigger at zero concentration, what you would find is a basal fluorescence that emanates from the cell culture. And that is shown here. So zero concentration means no compound is there, no glutathione. But once you start putting compound about 50 micromolar of our compound, and if you were to put it in, let it go inside and eventually check with the fluorescent dye, what we found at 50 micro concentration, we were able to see quite intense mean fluorescence intensity coming out of our system, which meant that we are on the right track. Our compound is not only going inside the cells, inside the neural cells, which is neuro 2S cell line, but it is also getting degraded, releasing nitric oxide, and the release of nitric oxide is being checked by the help of fluorescence microscopy. Now, what we also did is just to check that how long our compound is going to be stable inside the neuronal culture. So if you can follow this laser pointer here, if everybody could follow it, that from zero hours to all the way to 48 hours, we were able to see the mean fluorescence from a very basal level, slowly climbing up. Uh, around 20 hours, it started climbing up and about 30 hours or so, we reached the peak, the maximal output, the maximum output of fluorescence. And slowly, once everything was getting over, when all the molecule was being metabolized uh, and degraded by our neuronal cell line, the, con the, the mean fluorescence came down the way it is shown here. And at two days uh, of duration, after two days, we were not able to see any fluorescence, which is above and beyond the basal fluorescence of our uh, cell culture. So it meant that we are having a sustained release. The release is slow and sustained, and it reaches its maximal output around 32 hours, and then it slowly comes down. So that was very interesting. And the second important experiment that we do, did in cell culture, or rather third experiment was to look at the neuride growth. So I would like to draw your attention to these first two panels, which says control day one and day two means in 24 hours or in 48 hours. What you see here is the neuronal uh, neuro 2A cells, the neuronal cells, neuroblastoma cells that are just quiescent, means they are there in the culture. They are not doing too much because there is no compound. They're just happily growing. And what we find, if you were to add our compound, the compound one, which I had 
showed you before, which I showed you before, at day one and day two, if all of you can follow, not only cells are visible, these cell bodies are visible, but I'm sure that some of you would be able to see that a small hair-like projections are coming out of cell body. And after two days, these hair-like projections actually grow, grew enormously. If you can follow my, my laser pointer, you see here, a lot of hair-like projections are coming out of it, which is, which is indicative of the fact, biochemistry tells us that if nitride is present, to do a job within a neuronal cell, it is going to up, up regulate protein production and that upregulation of a variety of protein production is directly correlated to the growth of neurites. So these hair-like you know, protrusions are called as neurites. So these neurites growing out from neuronal cells are a consequence of the release of nitrite ions, its conversion to nitric oxide and eventual protein up regulation or up, up, I mean, up, up synthesis of proteins, which is reflected in the growth of new rights. And if you were to look at little, you know, sort of zoomed out, what I'm showing you is control for day one and day two and with compound day one and day two. So now you can easily see that these cell bodies have these new rights coming out of their, their surfaces, which is reflective of the fact that protein, protein synthesis has kick-started because of the second messenger issues, and that is reflected on the growth of these new rights. So we were very happy with these results, and we thought that we would like to probe it a bit further, that what kind of proteins are being upregulated in the neuronal cells when we use our neuronal cells with these, or when we challenge our neuronal cells with these, these peptides. So we did three biochemical experiments that I'm going to show you today. The, the first one is the effect of our compound on the synthesis of de novo or new neuronal cytoskeleton. So uh, I would not go into the detail that time will not permit, but, but all the students and colleagues who are interested, what we are actually looking at is upscale or uh, upregulation for the synthesis of actin. Actin, as some of you would know, it's an essential component of neuronal cytoskeleton, and it's responsible for a number of biomedical manifestations and one of them being the growth of neurite. So these hair-like protrusions coming out of the cell body, that growth is dependent on the increased or enhanced synthesis of actin. And that is how it, it regulates or it controls the neurite growth. So what we did is that we, we went ahead and we did our experiment. And what we did is that we uh, chose the same cell line, neuro 2 a cell line. And if you were to just very simply walk in through these uh, four panels, the first panel A has our compound, right? It has our compound. And the, 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 the second panel is our positive control, the negative control. And what you essentially find is, long story short, that this particular panel containing of our compound is really lit up. It is really lit up because we are detecting increased amount of actin synthesis. When we stain actin with the help of FITC phyllidine dye and that dye binds to actin and under fluorescence microscope, we are able to see the right kind of output which is missing from all our controls, which means that our compound, which is HSHA2 or conjugate one, is, is upregulating the synthesis of uh, actin. And that upregulated actin synthesized over a period of say two days is being bound by FITC phyllidine and this fluorescein isothiocyanate uh, 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 phyllidine conjugate gives us the fluorescence output, which is measured by the microscope. And we are able to show that the upregulation up of this particular protein synthesis has happened. So that was example or Experiment number one, showing the kind of protein which are responsible for neuritic growth have been synthesized and we were able to show in this particular example. In the second example, what we did is that we went and looked for neurofilaments. This particular uh, protein, this particular protein has both heavy segments as well as light segments. I won't go into the detail, but what is more important for us to realize here is that these neurofilaments are part of what is called a cytoskeleton of the myelinated axon. So if you have a neuronal body, we know what an axon is. So the, the cytoskeleton of this axon is composed of neurofilaments. 
So if cell starts growing, if neurites are coming out of the cell body, then surely something is going to happen for the upregulation of neurofilament synthesis. And that's what we show here. So if you were to sort of uh, uh, go ahead and look at these panels, this particular is with our compound HA2, neurofilament, both heavy and light chain. The, the panel two is being stained with propidium iodide. So propidium iodide, uh, uh, my friends, is a dye that stains the nucleus. And now in the third panel, what we have done is that we have taken the two images one with the staining of the immunostaining of the heavy and light chains of neurofilament. Again, and in the second channel was the red dye of propidium iodide. So both of them were overlapped with one another to give you what is the third picture, which is the overlapping images, image of uh, uh, both staining by immunostaining as well as the propidium iodide staining of the nucleus. So here is the, the top panel is, is with our compound. And the bottom panel is a pure control. So we have just used phosphate buffered saline and it has no compound. So obviously there is not going to be any change because we are only treating it with salt water, right? Phosphate buffer saline is being treated or the cells are being treated with phosphate buffer saline. So this, again, this particular example showed us that neurofilaments were also upregulated in their uh, concentration or in synthesis. And that was a very heartening news to show us that you know we have reached a, a potential where we can upregulate a few proteins which are critical not only for axonal development but it it has all it also has implications in neurodegenerative diseases so such type of compounds which gives rise which give rise to such synthesis or enhancement in the protein output could be interesting from neuro, for for for, a, for neurodegeneration and that is one of our aims to look at at a later point of time The final example was the synthesis of neuronal nuclear antigen. And long story short, again, this is a very complicated experiment. What we are searching in this particular experiment is that in the same uh, uh, neuro 2 a cell line, we are trying to look at this particular protein, which is called as neuronal nuclear antigen. New N is the name of this particular protein. And you just please please put your attention to that the, this particular protein is necessary for new, the maturation of neurons. So it aids in the maturation of neurons. So what we thought is that if we are going to see some positive or beneficial effect with our compound, then we have a compound in hand which could be used for neuronal maturation. So, so, so one could possibly think of treating quite a number of neurodegenerative disorders. So we have taken our conjugate in the first panel New N immunostaining, we'll not go into the immunostaining part. Propidium iodide, which is staining the nucleus. You, you merge the two, two, two images to show what is shown in the third panel. And we compared, this time we did not compare with phosphate buffer saline. This time we compared with human neuronal growth factor. Human neuronal growth factor does the same thing what is we have just discussed. It is responsible for the synthesis of neuronal nuclear antigen, which is responsible for the maturation of the neurons. And as you see, that neuronal growth factor, which is again commercially bought, does the job and the fluorescence output is brilliant. Brilliant means it is much better than our conjugate. And of course, it is expected because nerve growth factor NGF1 or, 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 or one of those NGF uh, uh, that we have used here is naturally, it's a natural phenomena that, that leads to the synthesis of new uh, neuronal nuclear antigen while conjugate one is synthetic. Conjugate one is synthetic and we are now optimizing the structure to ensure that if we can come closer to the, the fluorescence output or the protein synthesis output that is achieved by the nerve growth factor, which is being treated as a control where we knew that the concentration or the upregulation is going to be really exciting. So here was the story of uh, a small gas nitric oxide. Let me quickly walk you through another uh, gaseous molecule, which is hydrogen sulfide. So hydrogen sulfide is, is something which is uh, which we all know that not an egg smell and so on and so forth. But some of us may not know that hydrogen sulfide is a very important gaseous 
neurotransmitter in our body. It's a gaseous mediator, which has a modulatory effect on signaling pathways. And it is again synthesized the way it is shown here. It is synthesized with the help of uh, an enzymatic, enzymatic conversion. And eventually the hydrogen sulfide produced goes and does its job through permeation through a variety of, of cells and tissues and does its job, job as a reactive oxygen species scavenger. So it scavenges the reactive ox oxygen species. And what is important to realize here is for all of you that it ameliorates dopaminergic neural, neuronal de uh, uh, deterioration in Parkinson's disease model. So if you can work around hydrogen sulfide or if you can synthesize nit hydrogen sulfide in a Parkinson's model or Parkinson's animal model or Parkinson's model where you can follow their Parkinson's disease, you are going to be on the right track of coming up with strategies that can actually uh, develop a cure for Parkinson's. It can substance or it can augment the, the potential or it can augment or potentiate our hippocampal system. So both nitric oxide as well as hydrogen sulfide, I am still hovering around the neuro, uh, neuro aspect, the chemical neuro as neuroscience aspect of these two small gases. So what we have done here is I'm going to sort of fast forward. What we did here is we did not use cell lines. So of course, cell lines were used, but I'm not going to show you the result. I am going to show you the result where we have taken our compound inside this particular transgenic C. elegans. So this particular C. elegans, the nematode that you all have, may have heard about it, it is actually a Parkinson's disease model that we have bought and also collaborated with. And what we do is that we have we thought that we will create a compound and let it be fed to this particular nematode. And we would see that how this particular nematode, which is a Parkinson's disease model, works with our compound or works with the synthesis of H2S. And some of you may ask that why this particular nematode? Because it is easier to work with. Our, our brain, our brain has say about 1 billion neurons, right? And if you look at this particular C. elegans nematode, it only has 300 neurons. So a very simple system, which could be converted to a Parkinson's disease model system with only 300 neurons, it is very easy to follow it. And the upregulation of this particular neurotransmitter dopamine can be followed very easily in this particular nematode, which is an engineered mutant for Parkinson's disease model. So I hope some of you would appreciate that, that it is a nematode, it is a Parkinson's disease model, it has very less or almost negligible number of neurons compared to a human brain. And that is why you're going to use this particular uh, system as, as, as a model for future studies. So we created again, uh, very simple organic molecules which had the potential of generating hydrogen sulfide once they are inside the, inside the cell culture or inside an animal model, right? So here are all the compounds, our precursor ADTCOH, certain peptide-based systems, and you can easily see this particular, you know, uh, heterocyclic structure. And the, the, the reason one would put this particular heterocyclic structure is once it is interacted or once it is metabolized in our body or it in, in, in this our animal model body, if you will, right, it is going to release hydrogen sulfide. So hydrogen sulfide synthesis can be achieved by these molecules. And what we found is that over a long period of time, about 300 to 400 minutes, we were able to generate hydrogen sulfide at a very, very stable concentrations. And that was quite interesting, quite exciting. And that we are on the right track, not only in terms of our design strategy of these molecules, but also putting them in the, in the animal and eventually coming out with the data that tells us that hydrogen sulfide is, in, hydrogen sulfide is indeed being synthesized inside the body. Then we went ahead, as I had mentioned to you, that H2 has is this extreme role of uh, reactive oxygen species suppression. So what we have done here is, I'm going to uh, put it out in a very simplistic terminology, that what we used is a kind of bacteria which is shown here. So OP50 is an E. coli, which is food for this particular animal model. So this animal model, C. elegans animal model, eats E. coli as its food, right? So and what we did is that we, we 
mixed hydrogen peroxide with the E. coli that this particular nematode is going to eat. And obviously, if you are going to only feed your nematode with OP50, you would get the fluorescence at a certain level, which was being uh, sort of followed by us just to see if our C elegans are oxidatively stressed or not. But if you feed them with additional H2O2, the fluorescence output went up, which meant that you are really producing quite a number of reactive oxygen species inside the C elegans because it has not only eaten, eaten the bacteria, but it has also ingested hydrogen peroxide. So if the hydrogen peroxide concentration increases in C elegans, you would see more fluorescence because you are trying to you are trying to, to, to assess the fluorescence of the reactive oxygen species. Now, what we have done here is that we challenge this system with H2O2 with our molecules, which I had shown in the previous slide, right? And we were very happy to see, I must share with you that compound number five suppress the fluorescence to the level which is shown here means, what it means is that it did not let the senorebditis elegance feel the reactive oxygen stress because the hydrogen sulfide, which was produced by conjugate five was sufficient in quantity and it brought down the levels from what is shown here all the way to here, right? And of course, five was most, most effective, followed by six, followed by four, and of course the control compound, which is in this dark blue color. So what it tells, what this chart tells us is that compound number five has potential to suppress the reactive oxygen species inside an animal model. And if reactive oxygen species are indirectly related to Parkinson's disease, we have a compound in our hand, which can be used for neuroprotection, especially in Parkinson's disease. Now we went ahead and checked that not only you are reducing, so uh, can we reduce reactive oxygen species at the same time? Can we increase the amount of uh, uh, dopamine, which is the essential neurotransmitter responsible for our neuromuscular action? So what we show here is, again, uh, some of you can read the details of experiment here, but what I'm going to concentrate is right here. So if you are, if you are feeding your CL against only with the E. coli, this is the amount of dopamine release. If you were to challenge it with a control compound, no change in the amount of uh, dopamine release. Compound four and six did not really help, but compound number five, which acted the best in the previous experiment of reactive oxygen species, dramatically increased the concentration of dopamine, which is shown here. So it means that something which is suppressing the amount of reaction, reactive oxygen species also has the potential to increase the concentration of dopamine, which is an essential neurotransmitter responsible for Parkinson's or, or the lack of it uh, is responsible for Parkinson's disease-like syndrome. So again, very happy situation for us. And this paper was published a couple of years back in chemical communications. And we were able to show that these compounds are well tolerated inside an animal model. And it does what it is supposed to do in a transgenic C elegans, which is, which, which, which has the potential to serve as the model of Parkinson's disease. So with this, I'll move on uh, for stem cell modulation. And some of you would know that stem cells are something very, very fundamental to us, right? These are the cells that not only proliferate and maintain a pool in our body, but they can also be differentiated to specialized cell, different type of cells. They could go and become adipocytes. They could go and become bone cells and whatnot, right? So it is. So this particular picture tells you that if you have a stem cell, you can just keep it growing, right? You just keep proliferating it and maintain the stem cell pool. Or if you if if you challenge it with the right kind of cellular signal, right? You can convert these stem cells into specialized cells and you can do a lot of regenerative therapy with the help of such kind of modulation. And that is our eventual goal to come up with a strategy for a very focused regenerative therapy of wound healing, right? So as I was mentioning that if you can take uh, 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 stem cells and in this particular experiment, we take what are called as HMSC, human mesenchymal stem cells. So we have taken stem cells which have the potential to grow all the way from epithelial cells to connective tissues, cartilage, 
fat cells, bone cells, and whatnot. So important thing to realize is that the, there is one line of thought, which is just proliferation and one where you create specialized cells. We are right now interested in proliferation so that you can do the right kind of regenerative therapy for a particular uh, ailment or a particular disease condition or a biochemical manifestation. So we are not the first person to work in this area. There are a lot of small molecules, small organic compounds known which promote the, the growth of H HPSCs, which are human pluripotent stem cells, right? So you can go and have a look at this particular paper, which is from Nature Methods. It sort of describes that how these compounds are, are coming into being and what is the excitement behind these compounds that eventually will be very important when we look at the translational aspect of our chemistry research or the regenerative medicine. So what we have done here is that we have applied a different kind of uh, 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 experiment or we use different kind of experiments to determine how our cells are behaving when we treat it with our organic compound. And, on, and we, uh, in India at, at least, and you know, we are some very select group in the world who do what is called as stem cell biomechanics. The mechanics directly on stem cells. What I mean to say is that you, you look at the behavior, the sheer behavior which goes across these cells and you try to figure out whether the stress and strain, the young modulus of these cells change when they are challenged with an organic compound, right? So what I mean is that we use, we use a specialized atomic force microscopy to do what is shown here. So you take a cell, you put it on a surface, you bring your atomic force microscope and try to create an indentation. You try to press your cell with a, with a cantilever you let it go inside and you remove your cantilever just to see eventually that how long does the cell take to get to the normal position. So if you take your skin and if you put your finger really deeply inside, you would find that it takes a little while for, for your skin to come out and, and be one. It was before you started pressing it, right? So this is what we call as stress and strain curves, which eventually give us what is called as the, the uh, Young's modulus through the elasticity model of Hertz. And it requires a small mathematical formula, which is shown here. Of, of course, the force which is going to be generated depends on this particular formula, which comes from indentation of a cell with the help of such, such uh, uh, a conical cantilevers coming out of atomic force microscopy. So what we have done here is that we have taken three simple, uh, uh, two simple tripeptides, right? Tripeptides are so shown here, CAS, cysteine, alanine, uh, uh, cysteine, alanine, and serine, right? So uh, we have taken either, uh, uh, so, uh, so we have either taken the, the L series or the D series. And what we found from the force mapping of peptide-treated human mesenchymal cells is that the D series was little more effective in, in giving us the right kind of stress strain curves. And that told us that we should be using this particular tripeptide to study the behavior of mesenchymal stem cells. And there are a whole lot of applications which are possible if you work in tissue generation or tissue regeneration with small organic molecules, which are you can do mechanical support studies, you can do sort of exog exogenous stem cell engineering, all with help of bio and the tissue re regeneration with the with the hope to do a tissue. We have done here is that we have taken human mesenchymal stem cells. We have started working in a low density suspension with a, a, a with the insert inside the petri dish, which creates a wound. Which which creates a wound. But so what I mean here is that if you take a petri dish, you put your mesenchymal stem cells. You put an iron rod or, or, or a, little, a little plate inside, which does not allow the cells to grow wherever it is put. So the cells are growing around it, but it would not grow unless you remove the insert. Once you remove the insert, you have the cell growth on either side, but there is no cell growth here. So you have created a wound. 
now it takes a lot of time for these stem cells to divide proliferate to simply proliferate and eventually you know sort of fill up the field of vision by a number of stem cells which means that the proliferation has now yielded you enough number of stem cells after a period of time which can which can give you regeneration of the wound that was created by this particular insert so what we have done here is that we have created this particular wound the, the way it is shown here so these yellow arrows show you that the kind of uh, uh, sort of wound that was created by the insert so stem cells are here stem cells are here so i would not go through these entire panel but you would eventually find out looking at the panel that the d tripeptide filled up the gap most effectively and most quickly telling us that here is a, a here is a methodology now or or a tripeptide which is available with us that can serve as a that has regenerative capacity and we were quite happy with it we did a lot of biochemistry i will not really go in the detail but for some of us who are uh, uh, biochemistry aficionados we did the western blots for vimentin and alpha tubulin both these proteins are responsible to tell us that whether the the wound healing has occurred through a particular mechanism or it is just a, a you know sort of a fluke or a shot in the dark so we were able to show that indeed we were acting through a respected biochemical mechanism that eventually led us to the wound healing and through that uh, a regenerative pathway for the wound creation where human mesenchymal cells were eventually able to fill up the field of vision and close the wound that was artificially created finally just maybe four or five slides quickly to go through applied coloration and i don't have to i'm sure tell this audience that we what we see as natural colors right what we see as as natural colors is, is, is something that sort of comes to us uh, uh, through a number of chromophoric materials through uh, a quantum effects through through whole whole bunch of physical principles that give us beautiful chameleon chameleon colors that gives us beautiful peacock feathers and so on so forth so we were interested we are quite interested in applied coloration as a as as a how shall i say as a offshoot to some of the work that we have we do in the lab with our peptides and we just showed you chameleon as peacock and peacock but also morpho butterflies who can forget these butterflies who have these very beautiful color when you look at butterflies all these natural colors that come into uh, uh, into being when these butterf butterflies are fluttering in the sunshine the light comes out of these photonic crystals and there in the photonic crystals you have whole lot of metals metal oxides etc and when it interacts with the light or, or, or with the light energy what you find is uh, magnificent colors and which is responsible or it is coming from very complex and intricate topologies which are part of the butterfly feather or a peacock feather and you can observe under microscope without any problem right so what we did is what we were doing something else this is a totally totally you know uh, out of the blue uh, uh, result that we got we were making this particular pentapeptide from malarial antigen we were trying to do something in malaria and we synthesized this pentapeptide and my student just for the heck of it just out of interest saw thought that what will happen if this uh, this peptide solution is put on a microscope grid or under scanning microscope and she was very happy to see these these oval egg like structures if you will on i mean they were dotted inside the field of vision there are a lot of such structures and they were very soft in nature we could do whole lot of you know ion beam studies and also the kind of uh, stability studies were done on these structures and then it came to us i mean a bright idea came to us that one of our collaborators in, in tel aviv university was studying the these these defined structures and their interaction with electromagnetic radiation so we thought okay we will shake hands and we will try to find out what good our thing is for i mean these pentapeptides and we were amazed actually amazed and delighted that if you take our pentapeptide spread it on a surface and if you do a bright field imaging you see this beautiful rainbow color here beautiful rainbow color and if you go more deep into the 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 structure or the morphology of this this particular thing what you find is that you would see such kind of spherical structures and they were very beautiful in 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 nature 
and they were able to show us that you know uh, that indeed such structures have uh, uh, potential to interact with electromagnetic radiation and eventually produce these beautiful colors which we used to write iit kanpur iitu which is tel aviv university in the reflectance ward and you were you you have to believe me that beautiful beautiful color diagrams were obtained which is shown here with the help of this particular pentapeptide and we we thought that we are on the right track this is an interesting phenomenon that should be studied further and we found out that the reason we were getting color out of this pentapeptide when it is present on the surface is through what is called as me scattering we all have heard of rayleigh scattering when we look at the beautiful red color of the sky when we look at beautiful uh, yellowish orange color of the sky we we know what is going on how light is interacting with the particles present in the medium and you are getting the the these these beautiful colors of the sky and of course in the similar fashion there is another phenomenon called as me scattering which is for homogeneous particles so homogeneous particles when they interact with electromagnetic radiation they offer what you call as the me scattering i will not go into the, the detail all of you uh, if whoever is interested in fact uh, can read it uh, either in wikipedia the reference is cited here or to a standard physics textbook where large spherical particles could interact with electromagnetic radiation to offer you a, a beautiful coloration that we were able to sh show you in the previous slides again what we did whole bunch of studies here we did you know uh, evaporation studies we did surface studies what kind of surfaces are good because we want to eventually deliver and a sort of develop and deliver colors which are artificially which can be artificially created only by the the incident light which is falling on the on the surface right so we were able to create quite a number of structures and the study is just published in journal of colloid and interfacial science you may wish to look it up that was uh, pretty interesting and eventually we would like to do topology control we would like to create not only egg shaped structures but a square i mean a, a cube or a sphere or a long tubular structures and we would like to see how these structures are going to interact with electromagnetic radiation and what kind of hydrophobicity versus hydrophilicity structure eventually gives us the modulation of color that is going to be very interesting for 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 future development and last two slides basically we work on quite a number of diverse areas including chemical biology of uh, 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 antibiotics we 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 synthesize new antibiotics we do quite a bit of detection in the body we we are even uh, looking at a patent and a commercial product eventually that is going to measure uric acid in the blood at nanomolar or even uh, picomolar concentration so here are certain publications in bioanalysis in new antibiotics amyloid modulation and we also work on functional materials and computational modeling of materials and of course in conducting materials i i told you that we are working on dna based batteries or dna nuclear based batteries which is already published we do quite a bit of modeling and we work on interfacial systems for uh, catalysis and for even water purification so it's all collaborations that we work very effortlessly and and this is where we stand and finally i would like to thank you for this offer to interact with you through this inspire series although uh, i showed you very diverse examples of our interest but what is important for all of us to realize is that even simple molecules so the tripeptides simple tripeptides that we have synthesized they have the potential to interact with biological systems and give you fantastic results so not every time you have to synthesize huge structures to to see something of interest even a simple tripeptide can offer you or a, or a simple conjugate can offer you fantastic biochemical manifestations that could be taken forward for translation so with these few words and a profuse thank you for uh, being here uh, listening to me i would like to again reiterate my acknowledgement my gratitude to professor vikram singh he is the mentor that i am so fortunate to have and i am so happy to see him face to face today thank you very much uh, back to you professor vikram singh okay uh, professor sandeep uh... Thank you very much for your talk uh, today's uh, evening. Uh, I mean, it's really, uh, I mean, really informative, particularly in the areas of neuroscience 
and STEM cell engineering. And it includes all other forms of science. So thank you very much, sir. So it's important for all the graduates, undergraduates, and professors, teachers, and everyone. So uh, we would like to go with some questions right now. Uh, I would like to have some questions from the audience. Audience? Hello, I'm Professor Ayanti from Chemistry Department. Uh, I have Hello. a question. Hello. I have a question regarding this uh, uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors you talk about uh, when you take these compounds. Uh, and I'm wondering whether if you take uh, antidepressive drugs, which are already monoamine oxidase inhibitors, uh, would that do the same thing uh, like what you explained? So, so uh, that's an excellent question, madam. So what we are trying to do here is achieve, this simi uh, achieve a similar result by using uh, the synthesis of hydrogen sulfide. So yes. we are approaching the problem with the help of hydrogen sulfide synthesis uh, while not really looking at uh, the monoamine oxidase upregulation or downregulation, but it is an interesting thought. Yeah. We have not done activity studies that if you were to take our compound and MAO, A, B inhibitors, what would be the combined effect? We have not done it, but at the moment, we are happy to share with you that what happens if you have sufficient amount of hydrogen sulfide in the system that gives mm -hmm. you something similar or an effect which you would like to see with MAO inhibitors. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I hope it answers your question. Uh, yes. More questions from the audience? We would love to have more questions from the audience. Uh, I have some more questions if I, if I ask it, to, I hope it's okay. <laughs> madam, go ahead, go ahead, madam. Yes, actually, uh, it's very interesting talk for me and I'm, it's uh, bioanalytical chemistry is my field also. Okay. And uh, I'm wondering when it comes to the neuroscience in your group, do you do computational neuroscience? Uh, as of now, we do not have any reason to do computational neuroscience, but we have done computations in new antibiotics. What we have done there is that we have designed some really fantastic molecules. We have also got patent on these molecules as new antibiotics, and we have used computational approaches to show how these molecules actually serve as you know antibiotics. So at the moment, we have not touched I mean, have, we have not brought computations and neuroscience together, but we have uh -huh. done computational work in antibiotics. Antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Yes, so yes. Regarding uh, uh, antibiotic, uh, I mean, the resistance, because we are getting antibiotic resistance, right? Yes, so are you of focusing course. on that? Uh, yes, yes, we are working on multi-drag resistance. And in fact, right now, we, I have a, a major project with India and Germany on coming up with new strategies for MDR, you know, and how to overcome this multi-drug resistance. So we now have our uh, toolbox, basically the compounds that we have synthesized are excellent. And uh, we hope to sort of bring out some new interesting thoughts in the field, how this can be challenged, how MDR can be overcome, or if we could even come, come up with few test compounds that could be picked up by pharmaceutical industry. Okay, right. thank you. Yes, thank you. Professor Verma, uh, well, while we are waiting for questions from the audience, I have a question myself now. Uh, yes, so How about the, uh, the cellular toxicity uh, from uh, DFFM acetate, uh, like two neuro, two A cells, I think? Is there a cell? Uh, actually, ma'am, we use very less quantity, just enough to get a fluorescence output. And uh -huh. we have done all required controls and we do not see any uh, sort of, if you were killing off neuro to a cell line with that FFM acetate. So that is not really a, a big issue because the amount used is just enough to get the fluorescence output. Okay, uh, thank you uh, very much for your answer. I think there is uh, one question in the chat window as well. Uh, this is the question in the chat window. You were talking about measuring, analyzing the shear stress strain force via AFM on living cells. In this part of the research, how cell samples slash cell lines were prepared in order to analyze on AFM technique? 
So uh, it's, a, it's a standard way of fixing cells on a given surface. So if you are using mica surface or if you are using any XYZ surface where you have fixed your cells, that is your strategy to bring in the live cells or dead cells either way. And then once that is done, then you just bring in your cantilever of a force constant. That is very important because fixing is something textbook. But to come up with the cantilever of the right force constant that would allow you to get the right indentation, that is important. So uh, it's a standard technique. I mean, I'd be happy whoever has asked this question to refer to our paper in the experimental section, you can read how these cells were fixed. And if you have a specific question, I can also email back uh, the details of how it was fixed and how the indentation was done by the atomic force microscope. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, a, yeah. it's a very standard textbook, mm -hmm. standard textbook fixation of uh, these cells. Yeah. Yeah, I'll let the, we'll let the person know your email address sure. so that he or sure. she can ask the question directly. And uh, I myself has another question though. Uh, so is there a special reason to select C. elegant as the, uh, the uh, animal model for the study? Uh, no special reason, ma'am. What, what we wanted is to graduate from the cell culture. So if you, we graduate from the cell culture, we came across uh, this, this uh, particular nematode which is sold commercially as a Parkinson's disease model. So you do not have to do too much because the alpha synuclein that is going to create the Lewy body here is connected in this particular C elegance to yellow fluorescent protein, right? Mm -hmm. So the entire setup is well orchestrated. So you can just buy this C elegance and start your experiment. So we thought it is easier for us to maintain a C elegance uh, uh, sort of uh, culture and use it as and when needed for our experiment. So. That was the prime prime motivation to use silk C elegance. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Yeah, uh, I would like sure. to have a couple of other questions from the audience. Yeah, professor, could you explain the role of cytochrome P450 in that C elegance uh, study? So, what I meant was that when you take these uh, thiolanes and when it is ingested by C. elegans, right? Mm -hmm. So the microsomal metabolic, uh, microsomal metabolic processes which involve cytochrome P450 fraction, right? They yes. are implicated in metabolizing the thiolanes. And when yes. these thiolanes are metabolized by P450, it releases H2S. So nice. P450 is merely being used as an enzyme system to metabolize the thiolane part of the conjugate. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. We would like to have one more question with the uh, time restriction. Okay, it looks like uh, we don't have uh, any other questions from the audience. Uh, thank you very much again. Uh, I would like to uh, move to uh, Dr. Melanie Thomas now. Uh, thank you, Dr. Manjula. Um, so uh, it's with great pleasure I propose the word of thanks on this special occasion as we mark the 10th webinar of INSPIRE series organized by the Department of Chemistry, University of Peradeniya. First, I would like to express my gratitude to today's guest speaker, Professor Sandeep Parma, for that informative webinar, which certainly motivated our students in numerous ways. Dear Professor Varma, I really appreciate you attending our event despite your busy schedule. Being an influential person you are, serving both academic and administrative sectors. I'm sure that the inspiration you built today will pave the way towards their higher studies and inspire them to be great scientists just like you in the future. I'd thank also you. like to thank our dear sir, Professor Andra Vikramasinghe for inviting Professor Varma for our 10th Inspire webinar and hosting him today. I'd like to especially thank Professor Mano Devi Ganehenage, the head of the Department of Chemistry, the pioneer of the Inspire initiative who led and supported us in making each and every Inspire event a success. Dear Madam, thank you very much for your guidance and vision to inspire young minds. 
The INSPA initiative began this year with the intention of helping undergraduate and postgraduate students to find the hidden scientists in them and to inspire them to achieve their goals in conquering the scientific world. We've completed 10 webinars by inviting world-renowned scientists and the guidance rendered by the academic staff members of our department is impeccable. Thank you, dear Madam Sir, for supporting INSPIRE from the very step, nominating speakers, sharing your thoughts and ideas with us, and personally extending invitations to guest speakers on behalf of the department. Dear Madam Sir, your support towards elevating the standards is greatly appreciated. To the members of the INSPIRE team who spent many sleepless nights getting every detail right, thank you very much for your efforts and thoughts. Without your efforts, the, this initiative wouldn't have been possible. I'm sure you are proud of the experiences we all gained and what we were able to achieve within such a short time. At last, but not least, I thank all the attendees for being with us throughout the INSPIRE journey and for your active participation. I hope you will join us with our future events as well. Before winding up, I'd like to thank again today's speaker, Professor Varma, for the splendid webinar uh, delivered marking the 10th INSPIRE um, day. I'd like to take this opportunity to invite all of you to our next INSPIRE webinar scheduled on 28th of October, 5 p.m. onwards. The guest speaker is Professor Jayanta Gunaratna, a senior principal investigator at ASTAR Singapore. And his talk is titled Advanced Proteome Mass Spectrometry Technology and its Biomedical Applications. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you.